What's up, church? You feel good? I want to say hi to everybody watching online, in homes, in cars, in gyms, in offices, wherever you're at. We love you. Thank you for joining with us. I do want to say this. If you're in the Denver area, man, we would love to have you come join us for an in-person service. The church is open again, in case you didn't know. We are meeting at 9 and 11 at all four Denver spots, so please come hang out with us. We'd love to see you, but if you can't, just know this, and we all we know it, but I like to remind us, it's not the presence of a building that's gonna change our lives, it's the presence of our God that's gonna change our lives, and he's with us no matter where you're watching from. I wanna say hi to Brussels, Austin, and God Behind Bars campuses, men and women. We love you so much, so thank you for being here with us. We're in this series called Let's Talk Relationships. Don't, don't sit down just yet, and we're gonna pray. We're in this series called Let's Talk Relationships, and, and here's what we know is God's Word promises us that He sent His Son here, and we're about to celebrate the fact that He came back from the grave here in, a, here in what is that, six weeks, eight weeks? I mean, it's close. Four weeks? I know, it's four weeks. Woo! Ronnie, we gotta get ready for Easter. It's four weeks. Hey, so, we believe that Jesus came to this world to give life and life to the fullest. And, and, and when he told us that, he was, he was talking about every part of our life, including our relationships. Which means when he said Satan wants to steal and kill and destroy, he's talking about every aspect of our lives, including our relationships. And so we're gonna, we're gonna get serious today. Remember this series is PG-13. If you don't know if you want younger kids to see it, I would watch it first. If you're in a building right now, get your kids over to our Kids Rock program. We're gonna talk real, raw, open, honest. It's that important. We need it. God, we need you today. In every building, in every car, in every set of earbuds, on every screen, however we're getting this message today, I pray that you would speak to us. Speak to us about our future, about our present, about the, the relationships we will have, about the relationships we do have. And God, I pray right now a special prayer for every single person who is in a relationship right now, going through a difficult time, wondering if they're going to make it, wondering if God could actually do something, wondering if miracles still happen. I pray today that you would elevate our faith and remind us that you're still the God of miracles, and that includes our relationships, present and future. It includes our marriages, and we thank you for that. God, speak to us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Air high five somebody, have a seat. If you are joining us for the first time, whether in person or online, I just wanna say, what's up? We're glad you're here. Uh, you, I, I hope you noticed already that this might not be the same sort of environment you're used to. You probably already see that if you're watching on a screen from somewhere. We like to get after it. We like to have fun. We like to get real serious about God and what he has for us. We believe part of that is a, it's a lot of joy in the process. And, and we're gonna do something today that, um, honestly, church, I've never seen done before. I'm not saying it hasn't, I just haven't seen it. Um, I'm going to talk about, with my wife, we're gonna talk about some of the darkest times of my personal life of anxiety and depression and even at times suicidal thoughts and what she did to help me get through it. I'm telling you, you know, Romans 12, 15 says we're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice and we're supposed to mourn with those who mourn. And, and the truth is, is we're pretty good at rejoicing with those who rejoice. As long as we can get jealousy off to the side and behind us. We're pretty good at rejoicing with people who are rejoicing. We, we, we do that naturally without any training. It's the mourn with those who mourn where we struggle. And it's not because we don't want to, it's oftentimes, and I bet you've felt this, I don't know how to. My spouse is struggling, my friend is struggling, my parent, my sibling, my, my, my fiance, whatever. And, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know what to say, and I feel so awkward, and here's what we think. I might just make it worse, and so we do what, the opposite of what we're supposed to do, and we just back out and go, good luck. We don't say it, but we think it because we think that's just safer. Ecclesiastes says, pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. 
right? We're supposed to be there for our loved ones, especially in times of struggle, especially when things get really bad. It's that awkward, I don't know what to do and don't know what to say that kind of keeps us from it. And I've noticed, me and my wife have both, both noticed in the last couple of years that have, as I've been more um, just forward with my story about struggling with anxiety and depression, um, and, and people have come to me like crazy in the last couple of years and gone, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm doing okay, but my wife, my husband, my friend, my fiance, my parent, my whatever, people have been going to my wife asking the same questions. So we just decided, you know what, let's talk about it with the whole church because this is going to help some people. This, this will bring some marriages back together, I'm telling you, church. So would you at every location give a real, like you mean it, Red Rocks welcome to my wife and the best part of my life apart from Jesus, the one and only Jill Johnson. Babe, you look beautiful. <laughs> Nobody's tuning into this for the first time, meeting us for the first time, wondering who the classy part of this relationship is. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. now well, I'm a little worried, though, as I can see us on the screen that our, our, our pants clash. Really should have thought that through, huh? Yeah, we huh? should have. Sorry. Sorry for all of you. How we'll dare us? To... <laughs> Don't tell Jesse. She'll be on that next time. <laughs> hey, um... Before we get started, um, I just wanted to, I wanted to give you a chance to redeem yourself, babe. Um, we, st we stood on this stage together just a few weeks ago, and some things were said, and I know you didn't mean them, and in fact, I don't know, you might not remember exactly what happened. In fact, Carson, can you show her what happened? 22 years. 22. December 12th. 22 long. Oh, stop. It hasn't been that long. It's been a it's while. It's been the best 22 years of your life. <laughs> the best and the worst. <laughs> That's no, not right. No, no, no. That's it's not right. No, it's no, no. You're best. done. You're done. It's the best. You're done. Jimmy, just you and me are talking today. The girls are out. And the worst. <laughs> and the worst. <laughs> and the worst. And the worst. <laughs> and the worst. <laughs> I have no words. I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> that, that was harsh. That was harsh. <laughs> and I, it would have been better phrased, the best, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But there have been hard days, too. So yes, best that, and that's different. Hardest that's is different. more accurate. Hard days, too, is different from the worst. It is. Because the worst means out of everything on the planet, there's nothing more awful. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm by definition. Well. Okay. Let's hunker in and let's get yeah. to business here. <laughs> Guys, we love you. <clears throat> so if this is your church... Um, I'm not going to tell you here in the next couple of minutes anything you haven't heard before, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, two summers ago, gosh, almost coming up on two years, isn't it? Yeah. I'm bad with dates. I just learned Easter's four weeks away. <laughs> it's okay. You've got a lot. Um, a lot. So I, um, I started having panic attacks at, a, at a, just a level that I'd never experienced before. I'd been dealing with anxiety for a long time. So much so that um, <clears throat> I didn't know if I could keep doing this job. Um, I didn't know if I could keep living some days. Uh, I ended up going to Alabama uh, for a couple weeks and spending some time with, with one of my pastors and, and, and a bunch of friends there. And then I went to seven weeks of uh, inpatient anxiety, anti-anxiety counseling uh, out of state. And my wife would come and visit me. And uh, the kids even came a couple times. And... And came back, still took some time off work, am now doing, unless I, something comes up, about once a week counseling. And there were times, <clears throat> especially in that first six months, where, man, I got so bad, you know, I don't have to tell you, <laughs> you were there, <laughs> um, that I didn't, I didn't think I could go on. I didn't know if I wanted to go on. And, and I just, man, I would just tell you, church, what I've told her before, but um, I just love the chance to get to say it publicly. Um, other than God, 
Um, you are, without a doubt, the reason why I'm still here and still doing this job. So thank you. I love you. Um, so we, this is unscripted. We do have some notes, so somewhat of a framework. We'll see what happens. When I ask Jill to talk for two minutes, she talks for eight. And so who knows what's going to happen. But, um, babe, would you just start? I know that you've made some notes on some things. I, basically, I said, babe, would you share with the church some things that were important to you that allowed you to be the kind of person that could help somebody who was struggling? Um, and so I think that's a good place to start. So yeah. you want to take it away for a minute? Sure. I'll just drink water and look at your beauty. Sure. Oh, goodness. I, this is hard to do this next to him because, yeah, I... Anyway, okay. Um, Carson, we'll play that clip next week. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, so, as Sean said, this is a question that has been asked often. How, how do I support my loved one who's just going through it? And so, as I was thinking about today, and as I've talked to people, it occurred to me, in order to be a support, you really need support. And so for me, I realized the, the support that I had going into all of the, the journey that we have walked with anxiety and depression, the support I had first and foremost came from my personal relationship with Jesus. That was it. Apart from my relationship with Jesus, I could not have survived this season at all. And so, and actually, as you and I were talking about that fact that, you know, in order to be a support, you need support, you reminded me of an illustration that you've used here at church before. You said, well, yeah, when you're on an airplane, when the flight attendant is talking to the group, they say, hey, in case of an emergency, if, if you as an adult are sitting next to a child when the oxygen masks drop, you put your oxygen mask on before you help the child. You have to be supported so that you can best support. Yep, yep. And so what I want, the, the part I'd like to talk about today is where did I get support? What did that look like? And if I could just take a minute, I feel like my job right now is to speak to the one who you are in a relationship, whether, whether it's a married relationship, whether it's a family member, a friend, a child. And if you are in it right now and, and you are the one who your family members are looking to you for support, if I could just take a minute and say to you, you will make it. Yeah. If I could yes. just encourage you yeah. today, could I be your support and tell you? <laughs> That's good, babe. There is a God in heaven that you cannot see who gave his son Jesus for you, and he sent his Holy Spirit to this earth to, to, to fight for you and with you, and you can't see him, but I can promise you he's there and you will make it. Yeah. Yeah. And so leading up to the days that you had your, your anxiety attack on the side of the road, it was interesting because I was just doing life as normal, and normal for me was doing my best to every day spend time with Jesus, having a quiet time. You've heard the guys talk about it all the time. They refer to their quiet time. The quiet time is just that personal time with Jesus. And so that's what I was doing in my normal. And it was interesting because the days leading up to Sean's major attack on the side of the road, I happened to be reading Psalms. And I noticed, I would read a Psalm a day, and I noticed all throughout Psalms this reference of the Lord as a hiding place. And that that picture of the Lord as a hiding place really resonated with me, and so I paid attention to it. And all throughout Psalms, you'll, you'll hear of God talk about himself as a hiding place. You'll, talk, you'll, hear, or you'll see him talking about hiding in him. And what I began to see and realize is that the Lord as a hiding place is simply his presence. His presence is our hiding place. Yeah. And I needed that because the, the truth is that when 
you or when a loved one is going through a really painful and difficult and hard place, the backlash of that is awful. Yeah. It's hard. Painful <clears throat> words are exchanged. Like the backlash of what your loved one is going through is really difficult. And then when you see your spouse in that place, for you who, who is to be the support and the strong one, you see it and it's unnerving and it's worrisome and fear sets in, like fear for the moment and fear for the future. And I think the Lord wanted me to see that he was my hiding place because he knew, he knew what was coming and he knew that I could not fight the giant of your anxiety and your depression on my own. Yeah. We cannot fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, yeah. folks. We wrestle against principalities of darkness that we can't see. However, there is hope. That's where I said there's an unseen God that is for us, and he knew, he knows we cannot fight the giants that we face on our own. We cannot survive the giants we face on our own, and the Lord knew that. And if we can't fight on our own, if we can't survive, then there's no way we can support, right? Yeah, yep. And so it was just such a sweet kindness from God to show me the reality of him as a hiding place. And I'd love if we could look at one verse that just I clung to in Psalm. It's Psalm 9-9, and it'll be on the screen. And I'm gonna read it to you, but... Take a picture of it so that you always have it. It says, all who are pressed may come to you as a shelter in the time of trouble, a perfect hiding place. The Lord's presence is our hiding place. Well, what is a hiding place? It's a place of refuge. It's a place you go when you need shelter, when you need protection, when you need safety. And one of the descriptions, two of the descriptions that I found as I read Psalms, uh, called the Lord's hiding place a shelter of love and a fortress of faith. And so if I can just tell you for a minute what the Lord's hiding place was for me, sometimes it was a physical place. Sometimes I would just have to escape to my car and take a minute and say, Lord, I need you. Not while Sean was going through his anxiety attack, but this was, you know, before, this is every day having to, escape to his presence. And again, it doesn't have to be a physical place. The presence of the Lord, when you have relationship with him, it's within us, right? So it's a moment of stepping back from whatever chaos is going around you, and you just saying, Jesus, I acknowledge and I access your presence. Yeah. And I can tell you all of those descriptions of a hiding place, a refuge, a shelter, a protection, a shelter of love, a fortress of faith, when I'd spend time in that place of God's presence, when I felt like I didn't have the strength or the ability to pick myself up off the floor because there were moments when I'd just crawl or curl up into a ball on the floor and cry because that's all I could do. But I can promise you time and time and time again in those moments of hiding within God's presence, it's like his, his unconditional love for me would come over me. And he'd remind me, Jill, you're loved. You're okay. Yeah. My faith would build because sometimes I would feel so hopeless. Like, this is never yeah. going to get better. This is never going to change. We are not going to be okay. And all those thoughts, those darn lies, right? That the enemy likes to whisper. They would fill my thoughts and I'd want to give up, but then no. Sometimes I'd just let worship music play and I could feel my faith rising. Not all the time, okay? Here's where I'm saying, like, we can't rely on our feelings. You just keep accessing that hiding place whether you feel yeah, it or not. Yeah, amen. And, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned something there that I just want to throw something out real quick. Um, I know for sure, because of having lived it, but also just talking with a bunch of people who are in similar situations where they're trying to help a loved one through some real tough stuff, there is backlash. Um, you do say and do things out of character when you're struggling. And, um, you know, would you put up that, that passage that, that has the fruits of the Spirit on it real quick? Sorry, I know I'm probably all out of order, but uh, Galatians 5. I know, I'm testing you. <laughs> 
But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm telling you, you need every single one of those things in spades if you're going to help somebody who's struggling. And those are the things that become part of your life when you decide to spend time in the presence of God. Yeah. And, and because I know there were times when I was just like I, like, I look back and I go, how did she put up with me through this stuff? And let me just say this. When I was hurting and, and I would say things or, or wouldn't get fixed and she'd be trying to help, she had this ability to not take it personal. And I'm telling you, you got to do that. You can't take it personal. The fact that you're trying so hard to help your spouse and it's not working, it's not an indictment on you. It's just they're struggling with something that you probably just don't understand if you haven't been in it yourself. And I remember there was one time when, you know, I look back on it now and I'm like, how did she just not like walk away and just, she had dropped her whole life was living with me in a hotel in Alabama. We were trying to get my sister to come stay with the kids because I was freaking out so much with anxiety and panic attacks that I couldn't be alone. But I needed to be with my pastor, but I couldn't be by myself in the rest of the day. And so I was like, please stay with me. So she's dropped her whole life to be with me. And one day I'm having a complete panic attack, pacing, crying, can't breathe, all this stuff. And she's like, babe, I'm here, babe, I'm here, babe, I'm here. And I looked at her and I didn't, I wasn't trying to hurt her feelings. I was just trying to like be me in the moment and say what I was feeling. And I remember looking at her and I go, I go, I'm alone. I'm by myself. And nobody understands what I'm going through. And she's like, no, I'm right here. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm alone. That's how you feel when you're going through something that nobody else understands. But now that I'm past that moment a little bit, I'm looking back going, how offensive. How easy would it have been for her to take that personal and be like, you know what? I've dropped everything to be here with you. And, and you're alone, so I'm going to let you be alone. I'm going to go home because we got three kids that I'm trying to. You know what I mean? But she had these crazy fruits of the Spirit in her life, and she's not talking about something that she doesn't do. There's not a morning that I can remember that I have not woke up to her already having a quiet time. It's so convicting. It's awful. <laughs> and, and it's just what she does. And, and, and like, like this week, I was like, babe, I need Ashton's. What I need is his helmet or something. And she's like, well, I'm at the church parking lot. And I know what that means. It's not our church parking lot. She trespasses. I'm not going to tell you where, but she has found a church in town that has a cross She's in the got parking the lot. Best view. And a view of some ever. mountains. And she trespasses there yeah. all the time. I can't tell you where, because then the people have like they'll have 500 cars there this week. It's a good place. I can share. But she's like, I'm at the church parking lot. Well, I know what that means. I got to go drive to the church where she's trespassing, and now I have to go trespass so I can get my son's helmet. But because she's, she's in her hiding place. Yeah. I'm telling you, I've just watched it from the other side, that if she did not have something real going on between her and God, she would have not been able to tolerate me enough to support me. And so it's crazy how... It, doesn't it all come back to, if you just seek me first in my kingdom, I'll take care of everything else in your life for you? Doesn't it all just come back to that all the time? And I have found that, that the way she was able to support me comes back to, she just seeks God first in her life. And she was able to help me in ways that she never even thought possible and tolerate me in ways that most people couldn't. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, and listening to you say that, I don't want anyone here or anyone listening to think, well, wow, uh, um, she's awesome. You know, maybe it looked it like... It was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> what? Thinking about that video. Oh, oh. that video. Whew, harsh. That's okay. Hey, we got to speed up. I know, I know, I know. Okay, you invited a girl. Girls like to talk. Okay, so lots of words. Okay, um, he said I would sit there and take it, and it, I, I don't know how you said it, but basically you said she didn't act offended. Well, can I tell you, yes, those words would hurt, but that's where I could. I can tell you I would supernaturally sometimes in those moments feel the peace of God that I didn't manifest. I would feel the peace of God come over me so that I would not then lash back with my words. But I, 
Every time I'm hurt, every time I take it to God and go, Lord, those words hurt. I don't know what to do with those words, but I'm gonna trust them to you. And then he works it out, not immediately, but over time. So. And you also went to, you also got support when you were struggling yeah. from counsel. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yep, he's moving me on. One thing I have to say so though, there. because I do have to give some practicals. He mentioned one practical way I supported him. He mentioned at some point, this is sermons ago, that I gave him a document of scriptures, but none of those scriptures that I ever gave him while he was going through it did I ever go looking for them. All of those just came out of personal quiet times. And I don't say that to say, look at me. I say that to say every meaningful moment of support that I ever gave Sean came out of a personal quiet time. Yeah, that's true. Every one. They were just my normal Bible time for the day. And I'd read a verse and go, Sean could use this. And I'd text it to him with an encouraging word. That's it. And I had to. There were moments when... She would do things. Let me interrupt. She would do things trying to help me, like in her own, just... Oh, you know, yeah. flesh, she'd be like, hey, babe, it's okay, I'm here with you, and rub my back, and it would drive me freaking crazy. Yeah. I'm like, you've got to stop doing that. Stop talking to me like I'm a child. You're driving me crazy. But then she would send me something that she got out of a quiet time. She didn't go Google verses on how to help my husband in anxiety, which is a great place to start if that's where you're at. But she would send me stuff out of her quiet time, and it would change my day. It would change my week. I would create screensavers out of verses that she gave me from her quiet time. I'm telling you, she talks with a sweet, still voice, and she's, she's a freaking warrior, church. That's who she is, and she fought for me spiritually in a way that I just couldn't fight for myself. So. Well, and there, like, I didn't... I didn't always have the words. I didn't know how to support him either. People always ask, how do you support your spouse? How do you support your child? And I almost hesitate because I kind of want to say, I don't know. Because it's different for everybody, but that will come out of your personal relationship with Jesus. I didn't get it right. And I had to free myself and remind myself, I'm not Sean's savior. Jesus is. It's not me. I'm not his savior. And can I give one scripture? If you have a child or a loved one that you're like, I can't make this work. I can't help him. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. Remind yourself, the Lord will teach you. The Lord will teach your spouse. The Lord will teach your children and great shall be their peace. Yep. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just trying I, to. He's I'm moving. At the yeah, clock. yep. Okay, so yes, individual counseling. I had to seek out some individual counseling for my own support, and I always feel bad saying that because I understand some people might be here and say, "Well, that's great for you, Jill, but I can't afford yeah. counseling." And so, please. Don't feel bad about that. I had a wonderful woman of God. Actually, as I was talking to her, she said to me, she goes, you know, Jill, seeing a counselor is great, but I have found the Holy Spirit is a counselor, and the Holy Spirit has been the best counselor I've ever had. And if you look, Scripture calls the Holy Spirit a counselor. So if you can't afford it, it's okay. You just say, God, I need counsel. You can trust him. He will be there for you. But counseling for me... Wait, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I think, I think let's, let me just give some ad- quick advice on how to find some counsel. Oh, sure. And let's move on to the next point. Oh, okay. No, you want to stay here. I do. At 28 minutes and 42 seconds. Is that where we're at? Yeah, oh. it sure is. Okay. Well, I got a lot of good stuff. I know you do. So, so. It's okay. Well, we will go long today, all right? So is that okay hey. if we go a little long today? You, hey, the counsel... We talk about sex in the counseling piece. Oh, let's go back to that counseling piece, church. Um, no, let me just say this. Okay, fine, fine, let's do it. We've got to be fast. A bunch of you will watch this and go, she's right. I'm trying to support somebody, and I need to be supported. i got to get some counsel. Um, we have a resources page on our app and on our website with a bunch of, bunch of counselors, a bunch of Christian counselors that, that we would recommend. Um, so please look into that. Um, if, if that isn't helpful or you're not finding, you know, a love connection there, um, go to your campus staff. Talk to the people that you volunteer with. 
talk to the people that run your campus and they'll, they'll help get you plugged in and help, help you get some counsel. But I really do feel like it's a game changer on so many levels. Um, and you know, we could read scriptures all day long about how the Bible talks about wisdom being found you know, with, with wise counsel, so. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. I, you just wanna talk about sex. No, you do, that's your favorite part. <laughs> Uh, PG-13 no, today, I, church. One, one thing I did want to say, a counselor, what, hard times highlight the fact that there's broken places in yeah. both of us. And I will never forget the day you stood in front of the church and said, I'm broken church, but will you have me as your leader? And I cannot tell you how much I respect you for that because it's it's easy to follow a broken but honest leader, but I also I felt bad that you had to stand up here that day. He had to say, I'm broken on his own, because the reality is, we are both broken. And that's what a counselor has helped me yeah. heal the broken places within my own life, yeah. so good. that we can both be healthy as we yep. plow, plow forward. Yep. So. And you can't throw out the sex word without telling them what you meant. Sure. So I had a friend when Sean was like in the thick of his anxiety fight. I had a friend who's not my counselor, but a counselor. She sent me a text and she said, hey, Jill, don't forget, don't underestimate the power of sex. Lots of it. And I've sent her flowers once a week yeah. ever since uh, that happened. And, you know, that is... Practically speaking, that is if one and only way. if you're married. Right, exactly. Right. I was going to say that. I mm, forgot. Just making sure. Right. We got some people in this church. They'll be like, "I heard it at church." <laughs> no, it is. It's 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 a it's a gift. Let me help gave. a marriage right now. Yeah. So, so a few weeks ago, we talked with Jimmy and Irene. We sat up here. We'd actually talked about talking about the subject of sex that day, but we just ran out of time, and we were we were. It's just the kind of friendship we have. We were sitting around at my house um, eating lunch after church, and the four of us were talking about sex. And we started talking about how it would help, it helps, it helps marriage so much to have really, you know, really good sex starts with really good communication. And, and it will help so many marriages if you will have just a real honest conversation with your spouse about frequency. Um, and I know it's church, and it's like, why are we talking about this at church? But talking about it at home is the best place. I think church is the second best place. Yeah. It'll help some marriages if you sit down with your spouse and go, hey, what, what's your ideal? What's your ideal? You know, how do, we, how do we meet in the middle? Let's not keep operating out, uh, out of unmet expectations that we don't even tell each other about. And then we got even, even, we even got into more of a real conversation, and we were like, well, what, you should also have conversations with each other, not just about frequency, but like who initiates because sometimes there's some unmet expectations from one of the spouses or the other about like, well, you never initiate or I never initiate or I don't initiate because at one time you shot me down and I'm like, Jill, you can initiate every time because I'm a sure thing. Like, you <laughs> like, but you know, but we have to have these conversations because, because me and Jimmy were like, you know, if I, if we were honest, we hesitate sometimes to initiate because if you shoot me down three out of 10 times, like my ego can't take that. And so, and that happened one week and so I just can't do it or these are conversations that'll take your marriage to a whole new level if you get some real good communication about what your expectations and hopes are and, and have some talks like that this week with your spouse, not just if you're struggling. If you're doing fine, have talks like this because you'll be doing better. <laughs> okay. Ronnie said amen. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. No, We're, and this is roll. it. And I'm gonna, yep, I'm done then. So last way that I found personal support, again, came out of a quiet time, Psalm 37.7. I love this verse, and it'll be on the screen. Take a picture, quiet your heart in his presence, and pray. Keep hope alive as you long God to come through for you. So you say, okay, well, how do I keep hope alive? How did I keep hope alive? I first and foremost had to constantly remind myself of who God is and what he does. And so they're going to put a slide up, because I, wanna, I want you to take a picture of it. This is who God is. He is faithful. He still does miracles today. He's trustworthy. He's with you. He's working in your life, and nothing is impossible. That's the God who's in your yeah, corner. That's the God who fights your battles. That's the God that you can't always see, but he's there. And so you go, how do I do that, though? How, what else do I do? You listen to people's stories. How do I listen to people? When you listen to people's stories, it builds your faith, yeah. and it... And it um, 
It helps you, it keeps your hope alive. So how do you hear people's stories? This is a mom moment. My boys hear this all the time, go to church. I can't tell you how many eye rolls I get from my children, a couple of them, go to church. You need to be in church because it's a church where you will hear people's stories. If you can go to church, go. If you can't, listen. You'll hear people's stories, they'll build your faith. Can I say something too? Um, I know a bunch of you are watching, listening, whatever, and you're in a small group. Um, Start being honest about where you're at in your marriage, in your small group. It'll take your friendships to a new level. It'll take your small group to a new, new level, and it'll help you whether you're bragging on what God's done in your marriage or you're asking for help through a tough time. Yeah. It'll, it'll unify everyone in that group, but that's where we find healing. That's what James, Jesus' half-brother said, right? He said, we, we confess our sins to God but we go to each, uh, for, for, for forgiveness, but we go to each other with our struggles in life for healing, yeah. right? And so go, and, and if you're not in a small group at this church, get on the app, get on the website, hit the button, get in a group. We'll train you if you want to lead a group, whatever you need. We're not supposed to go through this stuff by ourselves. And man, it builds your faith so much to get in a group with some other couples. If you're married, get in a group with some other couples and start sharing life together and and the highs and the real lows. Because the only way you can mourn with each other, like the Bible says, is if we're willing to be honest about the things in our life that need mourning. Yeah. Right? Amen. And last thing, here's, here's what I love about what you just said. So I was talking about the hiding place as the Lord's presence. The enemy also loves hiding places. The enemy always loves to produce a counterfeit to what the Lord offers us in him. That's good. And like Ronnie said last week, the enemy uses shame to get us to hide from God, right? But when we exchange hiding from God and hiding the shame of our story or our sin, when we exchange that to hiding in God, it changes everything. Yeah, amen, amen. She's good, so, isn't she? Come on. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna take about five, six minutes, and I'm gonna, because you took all the rest, and um, I'm gonna share my part of the sermon. Um, <laughs> I wanted to tell you, from my point of view, the one who was really struggling. Um, and by the way, that, that that's a... That's an ongoing thing. I'm better, healthier, stronger than I've been in maybe ever, but it's still a battle some days. And um, I I wrote down five things. I'm going to fly through them. I wrote down five. I sure did. Number one, she was just there. Um, There is such a thing as ministry of presence, and I've shared that with you before. I was a chaplain at at St. Luke's Hospital. And, and, and I didn't, when, when we first started the church, and I didn't know what to do when I was going into rooms, people who were hurting in ways that I'd never hurt before, people who were going through tragedies that I'd never experienced before. And I told the lady I worked for, I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want to go in there. And that's where we find ourselves often when our spouse is struggling, right? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't, I'll stay out here. And she said, no, no, no. The ministry is your presence. You don't have to know what to do. You don't have to know what to say. In fact, sometimes she would do and say things that would just make me really angry in the moment because I was really struggling, but it was her there. It was the ministry of her presence. I'm just not going to leave you. I'm just going to be with you while you're hurting. I don't have a fix. I'm gonna, so, so, and if you're helping somebody, take that pressure off yourself. Like Jill said, you're not their savior, but your savior can use your presence to minister to them. Just be there with them. Number two, see how fast this can go? <clears throat> she didn't judge me. Trust your spouse already. Oh, trust me, your spouse already feels stupid enough. She didn't judge me, and she had every right to, because I was going through things that she didn't understand and had never been through at that level. And I don't ever remember a time where she let me know that I was being stupid. And you know what? If you've already done that, that's okay. Honest conversations, God's grace and forgiveness changes everything, and you start from scratch. But she never, and and let me just tell you that if you're trying to help somebody who's struggling, they couldn't be more embarrassed than they already are. I couldn't have felt more stupid than I already felt. I didn't need anyone else to tell me how stupid I was acting. Um, Now, she had every right to tell me because I acted real stupid sometimes, but she just didn't, and I just thought, thank you, thank you. 
She didn't pretend to know what I was going through. She just kept loving me. And then I put underneath that this is important because the number one lie that I heard in my head when it was at its worst is this. My family would be better off without me. She just kept loving me. She just kept telling me she loved me. She kept telling me how needed I was. In the middle of all that stuff, I knew if I never, if this is how I live the rest of my life, if I live the rest of my life in inpatient counseling, I can't be that needed. And, I, and in the lie that Satan would tell you and would tell me is, is your, your family's just better off without you because you're that messed up. And it hasn't been that long, and I get to sit here and look back and go, thank God I didn't do anything stupid. Yeah. There was a day when I actually called the owner of the counseling facility, and he came to this little house that I was renting, and I sat with him and my wife in the living room, and I just told him, I said, um, I, I'm going to end my life. I've processed all the emotions of it. Now help me figure out how we're going to coach our boys through this. Help me figure out how to, how to make Jill and the boys okay, because I'm done. Like that's, it had gotten to, to the lowest point I could ever imagine getting to. And she just loved me. And, but here, here's what I now know. It was a 100% lie from Satan. And I want you to know that nobody in your life will be better off without you. Yep. Everybody in your life will hurt and be sad and live in pain for the rest of their existence if you take your own life. Nobody will be better off without you. And it will end. Yeah. It will end. You'll be so glad you didn't. Yeah. She spiritually battled for me. Sorry. I spent a night laying on the floor one night. And uh, sorry. And I couldn't, I couldn't even get off the floor. I was crying the whole night. And I just wanted my life to be over because it hurt. And she would just lay there and just put her arms around me for hours. And at one point, I eventually got so tired, my body was just exhausted. And I went to our bed and I fell asleep. I woke up the next morning to her just playing music, just worship. And she put a song, she found this song, it's called I'm Gonna Be Okay. And she just put it on repeat next to the bed. And I just woke up to the words. You're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay. She'd send me verses, she'd pray for me, she'd play music, she'd tell me I was gonna make it when I didn't think I was. She just fought for me. You can do that. And you don't have to have the right words and you don't have to have a magic fix. I love what Jill said. She's not my savior, but she kept me focused on him. And you could do that for your hurting loved one. Yeah. And keep reminding them that he's there and he's working when you can't see it. He's doing miracles behind the scene. You're going to make it. You're going to get past this. You're going to look back someday and be glad you didn't do anything crazy. Yeah. You're not their savior, but you can keep reminding him reminding that person of their savior. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. There's magic in that. And then the very last thing is she told me she wasn't leaving. After that night, I don't know, it was one or two days later, we were sitting outside in some chairs outside of this house that we had rented and she was holding my hand and doing what she does and telling me you're going to be okay and you're going to... you're. And I remember you said something to the effect of like, you're going to make it or you're going to get through this or it's going to get better or something like that. And I just was like, I'd given up hope. And so I looked back at her and I was like, but what if it doesn't? What if I don't get better? Like, what if this is what you get for the rest of your life? And without hesitation, without skipping a beat, she goes, I'm not going anywhere. And that safety made such a huge difference for me, brought so much peace to my anxious soul, knowing that I have somebody in my life who cares about me so much that they see me at my absolute worst. 
and in a season where I've said insulting and hurtful things to them, and they still say, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know if you can do that apart from the Holy Spirit inside of you, which is why I think we take the whole thing back to where Jill started. You want to be able to support somebody? You want to be able to love somebody? Spend time with the God who is love. Yeah. And it'll change the game. And I know there's some marriages out there right now that are hurting. And I know you're at a place where you go, I don't know if we can make it. And it feels impossible. I'm telling you, we have an impossible. Yeah. We, have an, we have a God yeah. who specializes in the impossible. Yeah. Yeah. He's an impossible, miracle-working God. And he's active and alive. Yeah. And he wants to work in your marriage. He wants to work in your family. He wants to work in your relationship. He wants this yeah. struggle to be yeah. your testimony. Yeah. So don't judge him. Be with them. Tell them you love them a lot. Yeah. Tell them you're not leaving. Be a safe place. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Spend time with God. Get the counsel that you need. Be a refuge of hope. Keep hope alive yeah. in your family, in yeah. your marriage, in your yeah. relationship. And then give the almighty, yeah. all-knowing, all-powerful creator God yeah. a chance to do the impossible. Yeah. 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 And I'm a living, we are living proof that yeah. he does. Amen. Church, can you give it up for my wife? I love you. If you are in one of our buildings, would you stand up with me? If you don't have faith for yourself today, I have it for you. If you don't have faith for your marriage, me and Jill have it for you today. You got a church family standing behind you. If you're watching on a screen, hit a button and get some prayer. Go to our app. Go to our website. We got an army of people who can't wait to start praying for miracles to happen in your relationship. Start showing up to church. Start meeting some other people. Let some other people in. This stuff was never meant to be a solo battle. There's nothing honorable and valiant about going through it by yourself. And as a couple, there's nothing honorable or valiant about trying to fix all your problems without getting some help. We're here for you. We love you. We believe in you. But way more important than that is you've got the God of the universe. He's on your side. He's in the middle of your situation. He promises, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not going anywhere, no matter how bad it has gotten, no matter how bad it has been. I'm not going anywhere. You couldn't get me to leave if you wanted to. We're going to sing a song, and I want the words, let them minister to your soul. The God of the universe is for you. He is with you. He is on your side, and he is not leaving. God, I pray for every hurting relationship right now, and I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would do some miraculous things, that you would begin to, Ephesians 3.20, do things that blow us out of the water that we wouldn't have even had the courage to ask for or the creativity to dream up, but that you could do, that you could provide grace and healing and forgiveness and restoration. And God, let our faith be built up today, being reminded you are right here with us in the middle of it. And because you are, yes, we can in Jesus name. And everybody said, let's worship.